Son, and Holy Ghost. All right, come on. Let's lift our hearts, lift our voice. Sing it together. Oh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Every voice, praise Him, all creatures here below. Oh, praise Him above ye heavenly host. Oh, praise Father, Son. Lord, we praise you today for you are worthy of our song, our adoration. So as your people, we give that to you today. All right, let's sing. He came from glory. He came from glory. He took on flesh to save the lost, grace and mercy. And displayed upon the cross our redemption. Oh, he's the home for all mankind, one name over everything. Yes, one name over everything. All right, every heart, every voice, sing Jesus of everything today. Jesus over Declare his name over fear, over fear, over shame, over all anxiety, over troubles and all pain, over sickness and disease, for he reigns on the throne, all praise to him alone, one name over
Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord. Our song will be our song for all eternity. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ Church, may that be our song, amen. Jesus Christ is Lord. If you believe that he is Lord today, say yes. Yes, amen. Um, as we sing that, Jesus over everything, um, we're, just, we're boldly declaring the name of Jesus today as we, as we sing. And so let's just all, let's speak the name of Jesus together. Uh, on the count of three, just say his name. One, two, three, Jesus. Come on, let's say it again. One, two, three, Jesus. Jesus. There's power in his name, so let's say it a little stronger. One, two, three. Jesus. Amen. When we speak his name, there's power in his name. I'm going to read Philippians 2, uh, starting in verse 8. He says, Jesus humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus has the name above every other name, so he is, his name is the one that is worthy of our praise, and, and it, I believe this morning that his name is worthy to be said not just, just to be thought about. We, we know the power in Jesus' name. It's another thing to speak the power of Jesus' name, amen? To actually put it into the atmosphere and say the name of Jesus and know that the sound of Jesus' name, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so today we're gonna sing a new song called I Speak Jesus. And so it's just giving us as the church the opportunity to, to speak the name of Jesus and declare his name, his power over our families, over our circumstances, over anxiety and depression. And we say, as we sing that, as we speak his name, we are saying, Jesus, your name is above everything. Your name is over everything. So nothing else can stand because everything has to bow at the sound of his name. So as a church, let's step in today. Let's speak his name with boldness in our heart. Um, and let's, let's worship together. Let me see. I'll teach you the chorus quick. It goes like this. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Oh, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like the fire. Let's try singing that together. Your name is power. Oh, your name is power. Come on, we sing. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Oh, break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Jesus, we sing and say the name of Jesus today. All across the room, just say Jesus, say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I just want to speak. every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus and I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. We sing your name, cause 
Cause your name is power. Yeah. Your name is healing. And your name is love. Bring life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus oh, oh. cause your name is power your name is healing oh your name Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus oh, oh, oh. shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, and Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family. within your presence I speak Jesus oh Jesus and we have been given access to the power of Jesus name through the Holy Spirit so here in this moment with faith and belief we can speak and declare and sing the name of Jesus over our lives over the lives of people we love so let's declare this together let's sing it out we shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets and Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the hope. Jesus 
to stand in awe, to stand in awe of the mighty name of Jesus. Lift your hands, church, to the mighty, powerful King that we worship today. And we thank you that you love us. God, you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to this earth to be born, to die for us. And now Jesus' name is above every other name. And so may we cling to that name. May we tether ourselves to that name so tightly that every other name that tries to take to our attention, every other name that tries to take our focus has to fall and has to bow to Jesus' name. We love you, God, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Can we just give God our thanks and our praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. So good to be able to worship together, to sing together as, as as the family of God, as the people of God. And so um, because we're family, we got to know each other. So we're going to take some 30 seconds to meet and greet some people around you. Just tell someone, hi, say, I'm glad you're at church today. Go ahead, do that now.
Hi, I'm Mike, Communication Director here at Central. We hope you've enjoyed this time of worship today. At Central, we believe prayer is one of the most important things we do. So if you have a need, write it down on the communication card you were handed on the way in. You can put your prayer request and your offering in the box on the wall near the exits as you head out after the service. You can also use the link on the screen to fill out a digital communication card and prayer request. Thanks for being a part of Central's mission. All right, good morning, Central Church. Happy New Year to everyone. Yeah, we're off to a great start. If you're watching us online this morning, we're so happy you're joining us, whether it's our Facebook Live page or our website, if you're out in the concourse, if you're in overflow in the Oakwood Chapel this morning. Wherever you are uh, listening to this, we're thankful that you're here. God bless you. If you have a Bible this morning, please take it out, open it up to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, that's the very first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. If you need a Bible, there's probably one in the seat back pocket in front of you or under a seat if you're up front. I'd love for you to follow uh, our text this morning. We are continuing a series called Extraordinary. It's a study in Jesus' teaching uh, on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Back when we were studying Matthew chapter 5, we're, we're almost into chapter 7 now, but back in, in Matthew chapter 5, I intentionally skipped the verses that talk about divorce and remarriage because I'm afraid to talk about it. No, I'm kidding. I, 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 wanted, I wanted more time uh, to prepare. I, I wanted to, it's a, it's a complicated subject, it's a, it's a controversial subject, um, and so um, I, I wanted to, to do it right. Um, it's an extremely controversial topic in the church today, uh, and yet it touches every one of us. Raise your hand this morning if someone in your family or extended family has experienced divorce. My, my hand's up, my, my daughter experienced divorce. Um, it seems like nearly half of the appointments that I have in my office during the week are related to the issues of marriage or divorce. Uh, it's a challenge, and yet it's one that we need to, to talk about. We need to, we need to deal with that. Many of you are both divorced and remarried, and some of you have been hurt uh, by the church as a result of that decision. The very community that should have offered you truth with grace instead offered you condemnation and hurt, and I'm so, so sorry for that. And my, my commitment in, in this teaching for the next two weeks is to, is to present this topic in a, in a truthful way, but really married to grace. Um, we, we can't be afraid of truth. Um, truth is the standard, God's truth, when I say truth, God's biblical truth is the standard by which everything in life uh, we, we align ourselves with. We, we live according to God's truth. And even when we fall short of God's truth, grace meets us there, doesn't it? And that's the wonderful promise of his grace. And yet, we never, we never lower the standard of truth in order to accommodate our own opinions or our own desires. And that's gonna be the challenge for some of us as we talk about this issue of divorce and remarriage from a biblical perspective. It is not allowing our own desires or our own opinions override biblical truth. And so my challenge is that you're, you're open-minded, you're, you're ready to receive from the Lord, and that, that you take, I'm not, I may not be 100% accurate. Like, I may not have it, it all correct perfectly. So you're gonna need to take the scriptures that I present, you're gonna need to take my thoughts and take those to the Lord, study, search on your own, don't just take my word for it, but this is something that you need to come to, to an, an understanding of biblically um, for yourself. And so we're gonna, we're gonna be, I love what William Sanford Lesor, William Lesor was uh, a professor at Thul, uh, Fuller Seminary where I attended, and he said this. He said, we have nothing to fear from truth only ignorance can hurt us. New truths, by new truths, truths that are new to us, things that we learn, new truths always challenge old opinions. But new truths never destroy old truths. Truth is truth. God, 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 God's word says his truth is forever settled in heaven. The truth doesn't change. They merely separate truth from falsehood. And so our text this morning, we're gonna start in the Sermon on the Mount, back in Matthew chapter five. There's only a couple of verses, 31 and 32, that deal with the issue of, of marriage, uh, divorce and remarriage. Then we're gonna jump to Matthew 19, where Jesus elaborates 
on what he says in Matthew chapter 5. So let's begin in Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32. He says, you have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a certificate of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been sexually unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Now skip over to chapter 19. Jesus gives a little more background and explanation. In, cha in chapter 19 of Matthew, verse three, it says some Pharisees, some Jewish leaders, came and tried to trap Jesus with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, let me give you some background on that. There was a debate among the rabbis in that time as to what constituted a divorce. Uh, there was a liberal side that said really pretty much anything. If anything, kind of as, as dumb as she's not a good cook, uh, those kinds of inc inconsequential things in a marriage. Um, really, if anything displeases me, I can divorce her. That was the liberal side of the rab 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 rabbinical thought. The other side, the more conservative side, said, no, it's really only sexual unfaithfulness. So they come to Jesus, and they're, they're asking him to say, which, which side, essentially, are you on? Jesus responds by saying, haven't you read the scriptures? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart or separate what God has joined together. Then why did Moses in the law say that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? They asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts. Notice the reason uh, divorce was allowed, sinfulness. Uh, we live in a fallen world, a sinful world. So as, uh, though, though God's intention was uh, for no divorce, sin entered the world and that made, that made divorce a possibility. Um, but, Jesus said, it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been sexually unfaithful. That goes both ways. Jesus' disciples then said to him, if this is the case, it's better not to marry. It's better to stay single. Jesus said, not everyone can accept this statement, only those whom God helps. Now, I want you to see the disciples' response to Jesus' teaching on divorce. And, and before I get to that, let me just say this. The, the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching that we're, that we're hearing, is for his disciples. It's for those who are following Christ. It's not for the world in general. This is for his followers, for his disciples. The, the response of the disciples to Jesus' teaching on divorce is this. Are you kidding me? You're saying the only reason that we can get divorced is for sexual unfaithfulness. Now that was contrary to the, 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 the liberal rabbinical view that said pretty much anything is okay. Wait, wait, you're saying that, that it's only for that that, that, that that we can get excuse me, divorced? She's such a nag. He, he, never, he never fills my emotional tank. She's so high maintenance. He wants sex all the time, but he doesn't want to serve my needs. Are you saying the only reason that, that we can get divorced is for sexual unfaithfulness? They're saying, they said, that's too hard. There's no way. It's better to be single. Who can possibly do that? And what is Jesus' response? You're right. It is hard. He didn't say, oh, okay. Let's try again. Let me give you five more reasons, and then if that's okay with you, then we'll move on. Jesus said, no, you know what? It is hard. In fact, it's impossible. That's what he said. It's impossible. Unless you want to accept the invitation to an extraordinary life. That was the invitation of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. 
to live at a level above what's humanly possible. To live a life under the influence and control and power of the Holy Spirit, that's the whole key. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, you cannot live up to this without the Holy Spirit's power. So yeah, you know what, if, if, you're not, if you're not ready to enter into marriage, to be submitted to the power of the Holy Spirit and the will of God and the, the strength that he gives you, it's better that you don't marry. But if you wanna live the extraordinary life, if you wanna have an extraordinary marriage, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, not everyone can accept this statement. Hear it, Th this isn't for everyone. Only those whom God helps. Only those who yield themselves to the help of God. Only those who are willing to say, I can't, I, this is impossible. They are really hard to live with. I don't like a lot about them. All their little idiosyncrasies, they're annoying. Okay, then don't get married. But if you want to live an extraordinary life, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you wanna get married and you wanna have an extraordinary marriage, it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that that's possible. Lord, this morning we come before you and ask that the, the words of Christ would be revealed to us in a powerful way. That we would not lower the standard of truth to accommodate our own desires, opinions and feelings, but we would allow truth to govern our lives and our decisions in Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right, there are, there are four, what I found to be traditional views in the church regarding divorce and remarriage. They, 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 don't, they don't all agree, they contradict each other, so not all of them are right. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna present what I think is biblical truth, married to grace, as related to these four views. Uh, I'm gonna give a biblical response to them. Um, here are the four views. The first is this, no divorce. That's the first view, no divorce. The people that hold to that view in the church say that, that Jesus, that they take his words literally when he says, Moses allowed you to write a certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your heart, but it was not that way from the beginning. Never God's intention. So if it's not God's intention, it can't be our intention. So when you make the decision to get married, you understand what God's plan is from the beginning, it's not divorce. The second view is divorce, but no remarriage. Divorce, but no remarriage. So in, in that view, they say that, that Jesus' teaching allows an exception for divorce. But if you remarry, it, that constitutes adultery because you have been joined together, one flesh with that person, and divorce doesn't dissolve that. And so if you enter into another relationship, another marriage with someone else, that's essentially tantamount to entering into an adulterous relationship, okay? The second part of that uh, belief or that view related to divorce and, re and remarriage is um, that you only get one shot in this, that, that marriage isn't required. Marriage is optional. So you think seriously about it. You, you consider it. And, and you recognize that if I, if I commit myself to this, that I'm committing myself permanently, right? I'm committing myself for life. So the second view says, okay, divorce is okay, but remarriage is not. I don't agree with that view. I, I, I believe there are legitimate biblical reasons why a person can be both divorced and remarried. But I love the attitude of that view. Let me tell you why. I love the attitude that says, marriage is so serious that you need to enter into it as though you only get one shot. It's not like, if this doesn't work out, then I'll just remarry, I'll just find another partner. I like the view that says, no, you need to, you need to consider, this is your one shot, pray through it. If you're here today and you're not married and you're thinking about getting married, Man, take that seriously. This is the most important decision you'll ever make other than accepting Jesus Christ. So pray through it, get wise counsel, wait on the Lord, make sure this is the absolute right person and approach this as though 
I don't get plan B. I don't get two and three opportunities to make this thing work. I, I just get one. I say that to say I wonder how many marriages would not end in divorce if the couples thought, if I can't make this one work, I'm gonna be single the rest of my life. If I can't make this one work, I don't, I don't have the privilege of getting remarried. I said I don't agree with the view because I believe there are legitimate reasons to get divorced and remarried, but I like the attitude of, you gotta take this seriously. Enter into this as though you don't get a second chance. You've gotta make it work. As challenging and as difficult as it might be, be committed to working through it, okay? All right, that's view number two. View number three is divorce and remarriage are okay, but only for two reasons, which we'll talk about in a minute, okay? Divorce and remarriage is okay, but only for two reasons that we'll talk about in just a second. View number four is the exact same as number three. Divorce is okay, remarriage is okay, for those two reasons plus a few others, okay? So you see the, the, the spectrum here, no divorce, Divorce and remarriage with lots of options as to why you can get divorced and remarried, okay? So that's, what, that's kind of what we're looking at in this. And so I wanna give a biblical response to those, to those four views. Um, the first thing I wanna say is this. God intended marriage to be lifelong between a man and a woman. God intended marriage to be lifelong between a man and a woman. There's three important parts of that statement. Here's the first. God intended. That means God created marriage. It means God has a plan for marriage. It means that God has revealed his plan to us in scripture. So God created marriage, he instituted marriage, he gave it to man. He has a plan for marriage that he has revealed in his word. In other words, God has intentions. So he's revealed those. The first intention that God reveals in scripture for marriage is that it's to be lifelong. It's to be permanent. That's the first thing that God wants us to understand about marriage is this is a, it's a lifelong commitment. The second thing in that statement that God reveals in his word, we already read the scripture, is that marriage is between a man and a woman, a male and a female, according to your biological sex at birth. So marriage is reserved in God for a man, a male, and a female, and it's to be a lifelong commitment. So I, what would we expect to see in scripture if that's God's intention? If it's God's intention that marriage be lifelong or permanent until death, now let me, let me, I should have said this at the beginning. In all four of those views, if, the, if one of the spouses die, then, then remarriage is acceptable. So none of them say if your spouse dies, you can't remarry. They, they all say death is in a different category. So death releases you from that marriage and you can enter into another marriage, okay? So what would we expect to see in scripture if marriage is supposed to be lifelong? We would expect God to put things into place in the marriage relationship that would help it to be lifelong, right? So the first thing is this. Marriage is supposed to represent the relationship between Christ and the church. Marriage represents the relationship between Christ and the church. This is a New Testament revelation from an Old Testament scripture, Genesis 2.24. In the New Testament, when Paul talks about it in Ephesians 5, here's what he says. He says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united or joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's the marriage relationship. This is a profound mystery, meaning it, it, it was hidden in the Old Testament, but now that Christ has come, it's revealed in Christ. What's the mystery? That this marriage relationship reflects the relationship between Christ and the church. So what does that mean? That means that for New Testament disciples, New Testament believers that have the revelation that Christ is the Savior and read the scripture that says God's intention from the beginning that was when Christ came, the relationship between a husband and a wife would be reflective of, of the relationship between Jesus and the church. What that means is when you as a Christian, again, we're talking to Christians, when you as a Christian enter into marriage, you are not only embracing the benefits of marriage, and there's many, what are the benefits of marriage? Companionship, encouragement, support, prayer, love, sexual pleasure. There's a lot of benefits to a marriage relationship. But, but this verse says that if, you're, if your marriage is supposed to, to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church, that you not only, as you enter marriage, embrace the benefits of marriage, but you embrace the calling of marriage. 
the calling of marriage. God has a call on his people that get married, and that is that they commit in their marriage to reflecting the relationship between Christ and the church. You commit to that. You know that going in, that this new relationship that I'm entering into is, is somehow sacred, it's somehow special, that, that it becomes a witness to the world of what the relationship is like between Jesus and the church. So when I, as a Christian husband, when I, as a Christian man, enter into a marriage covenant with my wife, I am saying, I, I accept the terms of that agreement before God, that I am going to love Shirlene in the same way that Christ loves the church. I'm going to lay my life down for her. I'm going to be faithful to her. I'm going to serve her. I'm gonna help bring her into the fullness of her potential. That's what Jesus does with his bride. So if you are a young man and you're thinking about getting married, that's the commitment you're making. I am entering into terms with God that I agree that my life will reflect the relationship between Jesus and his bride. And the, the bride is the same thing. You are to reflect the love and support and, and encouragement and faithfulness to Christ like the church does. So if you're a young woman and you're gonna get married, you're, you're entering into that. You're saying, yes, Lord, I agree to those terms. That this relationship is gonna be permanent. It's gonna be lifelong until one of us dies because your relationship with the church is both permanent and eternal, amen? It doesn't end in divorce. The marriage between Christ and the church doesn't end in divorce. It's a lifelong, eternal relationship, and that's what marriage is supposed to be. So God gives us our marching orders when we get married. He says, this is a different relationship. I, I don't have the expectations on any other relationship in your life but marriage. So if you don't want to agree to those terms, if you don't want to live that way, then don't get married. Jesus said not everybody can accept this statement, only those that are willing to let, let the Holy Spirit help them, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is sexual intimacy produces a, 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 or creates a spiritual union between two people. Sexual intimacy creates a spiritual union between the people that are involved, okay? God created us in a way that we, when we are sexually intimate with someone, a, a spiritual bond or a spiritual union is established that's not established in any other relationship. Again, what's the purpose of that? To help us keep this thing lifelong and permanent to help us stay together in our relationships. Let's look at a couple scriptures. Again, um, Genesis 2.24, th that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become what? One flesh. As, you, as, as a young couple enters into the marriage relationship, they go through the ceremony, and then they consummate the marriage, God makes them one. There's this spiritual bond that is established. Now, unfortunately, I think, that's not just true when you're married. That's true when you're not married. That, that same bond, that same spiritual, emotional union happens even if you're not married. Here's what Paul says. Don't you know that, that he who unites or joins himself sexually or intimately with a prostitute is one with her in body? Then listen to what he says. For it said, the two will become one flesh. That's, that's marriage language. That's the same thing he said in Genesis 2.24 between a married couple. That there is, this, there is this union, there's this bond that takes place when you're, when you're physically intimate with someone that joins your hearts together. So here's the problem with that. If, 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 you're, if, if you're single and you're not married and you've lived a promiscuous lifestyle, you've been involved with, with more than one person, let's say, that's like taking a, a fresh piece of tape masking tape, and sticking it to the wall, and then pulling it off, and sticking it on another wall, and pulling it off, and then strip putting it on another wall, and, and, and pulling it off, and then another wall, and pulling it off. That tape at this point doesn't have much stickiness, does it? it it's kind of lost its adhesive. And so now you wanna get married, and so, so now you find this person, and you enter into that, and you, you consummate the marriage, and the bond isn't as strong as God wanted it to be because you've shared your heart. You, you've shared that intimacy with, with other people, which is why God's intention from the beginning that was, was that marriage would take place between two virgins, two people that have, have saved themselves in that way for marriage so that when you come together, there, there is the, the most sticky bond possible because you haven't bonded before. Okay, take a breath for a minute. I know this is heavy right now. 
I believe in God's grace, his restoration, and his goodness. So if, if that was your story, as to some degree it was mine, God is good and merciful to restore the ability to have a strong union and bond with your husband or wife, even if prior to that you, you might have made some mistakes. God is good, and through prayer and grace and, and searching him and staying faithful after you're married, God can cause that bond to be really strong, which is, which is good. So that's the second thing. So God, God causes us to be one so that we, we will be strong in marriage and resist the temptation to be unfaithful with somebody else. That, that bond of intimacy should be strong. The third thing is the, the, the leaving principle. The leaving principle. These are things God has put in place in his word in marriage to help us have a marriage for our whole life, okay? Genesis 2.24 says, for the, the cause or the reason of marriage, a man or a woman will leave, say leave. leave. That, that means forsake, it means depart from. Will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So there's a leaving that takes place in marriage. When, when I do marriage ceremonies, I, I talk about both the, the leaving and the letting go. Children leave, parents let go. Children leave, the, the financial and emotional security and support that parents have provided. I know if you get married later in life and you're already out on your own, it's not as strong as if you're living with your parents and then you get married, which is the way it was back then. Okay, but you're, you're, you're not forsaking the relationship. You're, you're not saying, I don't want anything to do with you. You're, you're not letting go of, of the, the closeness because they're family, but you're leaving their financial and emotional support. You're forsaking it. You're departing from it. You're saying, I am, I am leaving that and I am finding my financial and my emotional security in my spouse and in God. We are a brand new family now. We are independent. We, we are trusting God to miraculously provide everything that we need emotionally, financially, mentally, just like our family did up to this point. Now we're trusting God, so we're departing. We're leaving. It's like, it's like getting on a, a cruise liner, right? You get married and you set out toward the sea. And, and, and all cruise liners have lifeboats, right? In case there's trouble, what do you do? You lower the lifeboat and you head back to land, right? Well, when you're married, you cut off the lifeboat. You say, well, we're not going back. We love mom and dad, but, but they aren't going to be our financial means of support and emotional support. They still love us. If we're in a pinch, they might help us, but that's not what we believe. God is starting a new family. God is going to help us, husband and wife, with everything we need. Amen? So you leave, you forsake, you depart that emotional and financial care of mom and dad, and you begin a, a brand new family. Number four is uh, marriage involved a legal contract. Marriage involved a legal contract. Again, things God's put in place to keep the marriage permanent and lifelong. We like the word, when we think of marriage as Christians, we like the word covenant, don't we? It just sounds better. I'm in a covenant relationship. Covenant sounds soft. Like, you know, it's easier to get out of a covenant than it is a contract. And that's true. And that's why marriage was contractual. It really was a contract in the Near East. There was money, significant amount of monies exchanged. It was a, it was a public do and legal document that was signed. So, so you went into this, and the whole point of this document was to make it hard to get divorced. Okay, so here's what happened with money, the financial exchange that took place. When a man wanted to marry a woman, he would go to his father, ask her hand in marriage, and then if he approved, he would give him, the father, a bride price, which averaged in those days to be about 10 shekels, which was equivalent to almost a year's salary. Guys, how much do you make a year? Okay, you, you paid the old man that much money to get her. Okay, you, you said, I, I love her, I wanna care for her, I'm gonna, I know that she does a lot around the house, and so here's, here's some money to, to pay for the loss. Almost a year's salary. The father then would give a dowry to the bride. The dowry was usually more than the bride price. This is a lot of money, and that's why there was a contract. That's why there was a legal certificate, because there's a significant exchange of money. The bride and the groom also would exchange expensive gifts 
They were called tokens of covenant. We do that in our culture, don't we, with, with rings? We exchange something of value to say we're all in, we're into this thing. So, so the reality was if that couple got divorced and it was the husband's fault, if he was unfaithful, he had to give the dowry back to the dad. Okay, so you, they, they, could use the, they could spend the dowry. They could use it for living expenses, getting a home, whatever it took. So th that thing's probably evaporated now. So he's got to come up with a year's salary, almost a year, to, to get out of this relationship. <laughs> How many of you, he'd probably go like, is this worth it? <laughs> like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give away a, a house or a house payment or what, whatever it is, or maybe I should just work it out. If it was the, if it was the bride's fault, uh, he got to keep the dowry. So, so the, the, the thing that the, the, the whole purpose of this certificate, this marriage document, which was contractual, was to make divorce hard. Like, to make them think, do I, do I really want to do this? And that's what the, the marriage covenant or contract is supposed to do. You share vows, you make commitments in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, in good times and in bad times. Before God, I promise to these witnesses, to my spouse and to God, I'll be faithful. It's contractual. It's a legal document before God that we need to take seriously. And so it ought to be, it ought to be difficult to get out of that. The fourth thing, the fifth thing that, that God adds to bring permanency to a marriage is children. Children. So most people that get married when they're young, if they're young, have the ability to produce children, to have offspring. Uh, some don't, some, some it gets delayed with fertility issues or whatever, and some end up adopting. And some never have ch their own children, and that's okay. But for my point, God allows us in our youth to have kids. Grandparents aren't, don't you see the truth of why God allows people to have kids when they're young? <laughs> Every time we're with the grandkids, it's like, I, I see why we don't have kids now, these little kids, <laughs> trying to chase them around. We're too old to do that. But when you're young, he allows you the privilege of having, of having children. See, that adds a whole new layer of responsibility to your life. When, when children start coming into the family, this isn't just, this isn't just I'm, I'm, I've made a commitment to reflect the relationship between Jesus and the church. Now I've made a commitment as a Christian man or a Christian woman to raise these children in the ways of Christ. I've made the commitment to teach them what God is like. I, I've made a commitment to show them what a loving relationship is like in marriage. How many of you know children need the security of two parents that love each other. Yeah. They, they need the security of seeing a couple that, that call themselves Christians working out problems, overcoming offenses, dealing with betrayal, dealing with in, in, in dishonesty, dealing with hurts in relationship, and pushing through and overcoming through the grace of God. They, they need to see the reality of life lived as Christians. And, and when you begin to have children, there's this, this whole new layer of responsibility. In, in Malachi chapter three, when, when Malachi is talking about the unfaithfulness of the Jewish husbands at that time, he says, you've, you've left the wife of your youth. You've, you've been unfaithful to her. And then he says, what is God's desire? And he says, godly offspring, godly kids. Raising kids as husbands and wife to know, serve, and love God to understand what faithfulness is. So we have a responsibility to model that and teach that to our children, what it means to be a follower of Christ. That's, that's one more layer that God sets in place in a marriage to make you understand this is supposed to be permanent. Divorce has an incredibly profound negative impact on children in their lives. If, if you're uh, a child that's been divor experienced divorce by your parent, you know what I'm talking about. It creates lots of difficulty. The other thing is, if, if, you're, if you're divorced and you have children and now you're sharing custody, you have no idea if your ex is raising them when they're with them in Christ. You have no idea what they're being taught. There's no guarantee. So that ability to control their spiritual upbringing, you just lost that in many cases because you can't guarantee they're gonna raise them in the ways of Christ. So all, all to say, take seriously these five things as you enter into the marriage relationship. Jesus said it's not for everyone. But if you do want to enter into that, you, you can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, so, so let me say this. That was the first point. How are we doing on time? Oh, I've got four minutes. Good. Okay. <laughs> 
Point number two is God approves divorce in certain circumstances. God approves divorce in certain circumstances. I can finish this in four minutes, I guarantee it. <laughs> All right? Matthew 19, 9, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for, everybody say except for. Except for. Except, that's the exception clause. Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality. In other words, Jesus is saying there is a reason that divorce is acceptable. Not required, but allowed. And, and again, I suggest that, he, that, that if you fall sexually, that you try to work that out. I think in the long run, that's gonna be the best thing. I get that if this is repeated over and over, that that's changes the game. Jesus said, let's go back. Jesus said, uh, divorce is acceptable if there's been sexual immorality or unfaithfulness in that area. Paul says the same thing. Uh, let me give you the, the, the situation here. Uh, this is the first century. Jesus came, died on the cross, resurrected, goes back to heaven. The gospel is now being preached th throughout uh, Israel, and people are getting saved, right? And, and so now you've got a husband and a wife that are both uns unsaved when they get married. They're not Christians when they get married. Now, after they've been married for a while, one of them becomes a Christian. One of them hears the gospel and becomes a Christian. Well, th their life changes. M maybe they don't want to party anymore. Uh, maybe, they, 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 maybe they want to go to church all the time now. Maybe they want to give their money to the church. All of a sudden, their whole life has changed because of Christ. And the non-Christian's going, that's not who I married. That's not what I signed up for. We used to go out and have a good time. Now you don't want to do that anymore. And I don't want to give my money to the church. And I don't want to go to church every Sunday. I don't have that desire. And the non-Christian says, I don't want to be married to you now. And leaves. That's what Paul's talking about. To the rest I say, not the Lord, not I, not the Lord, meaning Jesus didn't address this directly, but under the, under the Holy Spirit's influence, I'm telling you, if a brother, a Christian, has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Now, this is interesting to me because I, I've known lots of couples that where one of them is a Christian and one of them is not. And, and, and the one that's a Christian, like, is really a good person. They're loving, they're kind, they're forgiving, they're gracious, they're honest. And like, who wouldn't want to be married to someone like that? Even if you're not a Christian, why, why would you not want to be married to someone like that? And, and the, the relationships that I've known, the, the non-Christian wants to stay married. And Paul says in that case, if you're a Christian, you've got to stay in the relationship, stay married, because you might win them to Christ. Your influence could make, help them to become a Christian in their life. But Paul says if the, if the non-Christian says, I don't want anything to do with you, I'm going to leave, then divorce is okay under that reason. Okay, the second point is God approves remarriage in certain circumstances, and they're the exact same ones. So let's go back to Jesus. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and then marries another woman commits adultery. Well, if you marry another woman with the exception of sexual unfaithfulness, you do not commit adultery. If, if, if unfaithfulness divided or broke that marriage covenant and you are now free from that, then you are free to remarry. Paul says the same thing. If the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound or under obligation to that relationship anymore in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So if that person leaves, then you are free to remarry, but only in the Lord, Paul says, only with another Christian, okay? Don't learn from your first mistake that it's not easy to live with someone who isn't a Christian, if you're a Christian, right? So marry someone in the Lord, okay? So what have we said so far? God intended marriage to be lifelong between a man and a woman, God approves divorce in some cir circumstances. God approves remarriage in some circumstances. So next week, as we continue with this, we're gonna talk about the other things that people in the church and scholars say are legitimate reasons for divorce besides those two. Okay, I wanna talk through what some of those things could be. Um, but again, leaving you with at this point, scripture says sexual unfaithfulness, Christian, in a marriage with a non-Christian, the non-Christian leaves, those are the legitimate reasons for divorce and remarriage. So as we close this morning, let me, let me ask this. And let me say this. To, to allow divorce doesn't mean it's required. 
The extraordinary life requires extraordinary power in order to offer love and grace and forgiveness and mercy and kindness. And marriage can be extraordinary in Christ. We're, Shirlene and I are, are witnesses of that. It, it can be extraordinary as you yield to the Holy Spirit. If it feels too hard, it's because it is. And you need the grace and the power of Christ to make it work. And Jesus is, is calling us and empowering us to live extraordinary marriages. So let me say this, are you married? Find the grace to stay married if possible. Are you divorced? Then live in the realm of God's forgiveness and God's grace and, and move on. Are you divorced and remarried? Then make Jesus Christ the center of this marriage. Make this marriage permanent and lifelong by bringing Christ into it. Are you single? Be wise. Approach this possible marriage as though you just get one shot and you're gonna make sure this is right. If you need prayer this morning, if you'd like prayer on, on anything related to marriage, divorce, remarriage, something got stirred up today, we're gonna have some folks in our prayer chapel, which is out the doors to your left and around the corner, just for some confidential private prayer if you'd like that. If you have a prayer need for anything else today, we're gonna have our, our people up here to pray for you. Don't let pride get in the way. If you need prayer this morning, come on down and we'll, we'll pray for you. And as you exit this morning, just keep in mind, this is our week to receive a benevolent offering. So if you can contribute to that, it helps people in our church and outside our church that need a little financial help. Would you stand with me this morning? And let me say this in closing. I, I wanted to say this. I mentioned the, the, the next gen, the, the, the Res Gen Men's Summit on, on February 4th. We're gonna put, Tom Henderson is here. Guys, if you need help, uh, in your marriage. Uh, you need to be, become the, the man God wants you to be to be a better husband. Man, you need to be at this thing. It's gonna encourage you and inspire you to become the, the, the absolute best that, that God wants you to be. Let's pray. God, this morning we thank you for the truth of your word and we pray that you would help us to understand it and help us to, to apply it in our lives, to make truth the highest standard of living. And Lord, I pray that you bring comfort and encouragement and grace to those hearing today in Jesus' name, amen.